Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Inside View with Teddy Panos. I am your host, Teddy Panos, coming to you from the Inside Lowell Studios here in downtown Lowell. Have a very special guest with us today. You may have seen a quick glimpse of her on that first camera angle. We're going to bring her in in a quick second. I just want to thank our sponsors for helping to make this podcast, all of our podcasts at Inside Lowell possible and making Inside Lowell in general possible. Thank you to our friends at Washington Savings Bank a local community-focused bank with branches in Lowell and in Drake. And it's real simple. I have literally opened an account with them just by texting and trading a couple of emails. It's that easy. They know their customers that well. Check them out yourself. WashingtonSavings.com. WashingtonSavings.com com is their web address thank you as well to our friends at reverie 73 they'll elevate your cannabis experience whether you're new to the world of cannabis or a canna connoisseur their store really sticks out it's clean it's beautiful it's bright the staff is knowledgeable it's friendly and they will go the extra mile to answer any questions you may have visit them at 1148 Bridge Street in Lowell or order online at reverie73.com and they're expected to open two more facilities this year, one in Beverly and one in Gloucester. And last but certainly not least, you see that kicking donkey sign behind <laughs> me, Hafners, it kicks they kick uh thankfully it's getting a little bit warmer you don't have to worry so much about home heating right now but it's never too early to plan ahead for next winter whether you heat your home with heating oil or with propane hafners takes the worry off of your mind securing your family and your home plus hafners gas stations convenience stores and car washes can be found throughout the merrimack valley and southern new hampshire call 866 it kicks that's 866 it kicks to learn more or visit hafners.com and with that we turn our attention to our special guest today congresswoman Lori trahan uh, was stop number three or four yeah, this is four. for you yeah. today yeah. This is number four <laughs> and how many more do you have before the end of the day just two just two just more two, yes and then you can go back to being mom, mom and yes, the like <laughs> it's funny the last time we uh ran into each other was at the lowell general hospital That's their right. annual ball and i know it, why where's your tux it's yeah it's got <laughs> a one once uh once a blue moon is enough for me but you know it kind of struck me like it it was kind of fun to see you out there and actually getting to be Lori Trahan yeah. instead of Congresswoman Trahan. You were yeah. there with your husband and you know, you're having a good time talking to friends, even up on the dance floor yes. every now and then you've got some move. I, I, I didn't roll any film on it, but, but you can Ooh, dance. You're uh, being generous. Thank you. How, uh, how difficult is it to balance doing six appearances today uh, throughout the district? And we're going to talk about a couple of them, doing media interviews, actually doing hearings up in Congress, and then being a mom to two yeah. young daughters, being a wife. Uh, how, yeah. uh, how have you managed to kind of balance that? Oh, well, thank you, Teddy. I appreciate it. It's great to be back. Um, and look, first and foremost, I'm a mom first, right? I mean, every parent takes the job so seriously. It's the most humbling uh, role that we all play in our lives. And uh, I'm just so happy that I'm home for these two weeks. Um, it's both my girls are celebrating birthdays. Dave is celebrating a birthday on Monday. And so, uh, yeah, while the days are packed, getting out and about and, you know, re-engaging with my communities, because I have been in Washington mm -hmm. a lot this year, uh, it's so nice to put my head on my pillow at home and put my girls to bed and have breakfast with them. But uh, yeah, you know, look, I'm still long on energy, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I, uh, I love the job is I look at this job as being very much in the district, uh, not in Washington. As you know, I'm on the first flight home after the last vote. And uh, I, you know, take the last possible flight down there on, on Mondays and really focus on getting out and about in my communities. And I think it makes me a better representative as a result and hopefully a better mom. <laughs> when, <laughs> when you joined us uh, last time, it was, uh, uh, I forget if it was either, you're about to start the, the next term in Congress or you had yeah. just started it. And we were kind of talking about how now you're gonna operate with a Republican speaker as opposed to Nancy Pelosi, who right. became the speaker when you swept in with your freshman class in 2018. How have the first couple of months, Ben, has, has the job changed at all for you? Sure. Uh, it's, you know, I think one thing that the that Speaker McCarthy has in front of him in terms of challenges is that 
it's really hard for him right now to unite the conference. Um, and so we've that's been reflective in some of the bills that have been postponed from coming on the floor. I mean, certainly they put their their signature piece of legislation in HR1, uh, which was an energy bill on the floor uh, last week. Um, but it was a rough road uh, getting the, the, them to unite or, around that bill. Uh, so, you know, we um, we're sort of I'm lucky that I sit on the Energy and Commerce Committee. We tend to be a little bit more bipartisan than some of the other committees. Uh, we're not spending our time just on investigate investigations and oversight. Uh, you know, we're working on mental health. We're working on health care and, you know, getting the costs out of the health care delivery system. Uh, working on big tech, uh, which I know we'll probably talk about in a little bit, uh, protecting our children. And so, you know, I, I get a lot of our motivation from the opportunity that I can work with my Republican mm -hmm. colleagues on things. And hopefully, you know, some of those things will come to the floor. It it certainly doesn't appear like it's slowed down your ability to bring money back to the district. You were just at the Lowell Community Health Center this morning uh, uh, announcing $2.7 million yeah. for some programs there. You've you've been uh, working on affordable housing money for the area and here in Lowell for the Coalition for a Better Acre, Head Start programs, early daycare, all, all sorts of things. Um, is that is any of that like new money since the new session or is that kind of stuff that was already budgeted for last term? Well, a little bit of both. I mean, there was a lot in the omnibus from the uh, the end of last year um, that's making its way to the state. Um, some of those funds are ARPA funds still, uh, you know, that are just getting obligated or, um, you know, getting dispatched to unique programs. I mean, when you think of what I was doing today at the Lowell Community Health Center, uh, they are specialists in helping refugees resettle in our community, get the, the trauma care and the mental health care that they need as they go through that process. And that's what they're doing for our uh, Afghani uh, refugee families. So I was able to go there and sort of see up close what they're doing. I'll tell you one thing I was appointed to that um, is is one, an honor, but two, um, very much in line with what I'm focused on in terms of the district is it's called the Regional Leadership Council, and it's focused on implementing the bills that we've passed, right? When you think of the uh, infrastructure bill and the Chips and Science bill and uh, the Veterans Pact Act and the Inflation Reduction Act, those were huge bills, right? There's a number of new programs. And so I'm one of 12 members that get to sit with the White House on how do we get that money to communities, to companies, to get those incentives out there as quickly as possible so people understand the impact that they have. And so many of the announcements uh, that we're doing are in line with those bills. And then some of it is going to communities to find out like, do you have a grant writer? Do you need help accessing these programs? Like, how are you, uh, act, you know, able to um, find out about what programs you may qualify for? So we're kind of playing a conduit role. Mm -hmm. And then we're also, you know, announcing uh, funds that are really going to have a transformative impact on these communities like like Lowell mm -hmm. and uh, the other gateway cities. Now let's talk a, l a little bit about uh, before you went to the Community Health Center, you were at the Lowell Early Daycare yeah. Center for something there. Uh, Head Start money, which we had, uh, we'd put a story out there from a yes. press release you Thank did a couple of weeks ago. Um, how how Im how important is this Head Start type money, the early daycare money for for working people? If you if oh, you could talk about that, it's it's everything. I mean, on the one hand, what Head Start has been doing for decades really is taking care of the early childhood development of our of our kids. Um, and also helping families, uh, give, giving parents the peace of mind that they can go to work and their kid is going to be in a, a great environment with proper nutrition, you know, heating that works in a building and also all that early development that really will set them up for, um, you know, more successful life. Uh, but when I think about this issue and how dire it is for us to invest in early, uh, early child care programs, it's about the economy. Uh, we still have women not returning back into the economy, into the workplace at the same rate as men. And there's a reason for that. I mean, in Massachusetts, on average, $20,000 per child per year. 
it's just out of reach for too many families. Uh, it would It's out of reach for the family I grew up in, right? It's the reason why my mom worked part-time minimum wage jobs while raising my three sisters and me because she couldn't afford to uh, care for us and and uh, justify that paycheck, right? So it's um, it really is something that we have to push on uh, to make uh, progress on that investment because it will, at a time when we're making record investment in our economy uh, and jobs, we need to make sure that we have a, a an early care um, infrastructure in place to support those families. And, and that's one of the complaints I hear most often is from folks. They have to make a conscious decision. Is it financially feasible for the second spouse, and it's usually the the woman, the, the, the mom, to go back to work or to kind of stay home and, and take care of the kids? And the, is there any way, anybody looking at adjusting whatever it's called, the means testing? Like, Because, mm-hmm. you know, obviously you don't want to be giving Bill and Melinda Gates free childcare. They can afford it. But that said, you know, for Massachusetts families, you know, people making 200000 combined 250000 a year may seem like a lot. You start to throw the childcare in there and suddenly, again, you have to make that decision. Yeah. Is there any effort to, to change that and make sure that, hey, look, as long as you want to work, we're going to give you childcare and, you know, obviously not to the millionaires, but to, to people, yeah. working class families. Yeah, I, I don't think that the, the you know, the top 1% in our country or even millionaires have as big of an issue uh, with find chi- uh, finding childcare uh, for, this, for their children. But you're right to point out that for everybody else, um, it's math. It's basic mm-hmm. math, right? You just run the calculation and you figure out, can we afford uh, to have you go back to work? Uh, and so I do think that um, we're seeing a lot of different things happening right now. Some of them are actually market driven, right? Some com- private companies are putting health care and incent- uh, excuse me, child care incentives in those packages because they desperately need workers. You're seeing this first round of CHIPS funding go out where the president basically says, if we're going to incent you to build, uh, you know, a, a semiconductor conductor um, uh, facility. We need you to provide child care, right? Because we need to make sure that we've got the workforce to support these investments. And so I um, I do I do think between Head Start programs, between early, ch- but look, I'm a sponsor of, you know, universal early education uh, because it's so important in terms of the ability and the potential of a young person who has that early childhood training, right? Three and four year old universal preschool, those are better outcomes down the line. Um, t- they tend to graduate from high school. They tend to go on to college, graduate college. And we need to invest in that if we're going to have the economy and the global le- global leadership position that we've enjoyed for, for d- decades. Staying with uh, children, uh, child safety is something you've really been focused on. Uh, I went back uh, preparing for our interview and I looked at your questioning of the TikTok CEO and yeah. you were <laughs> you were you were uh, very uh, terse with him. You don't believe that TikTok is doing enough to secure to to secure the safety of our young I don't think boys any and girls. The, I don't think any of the tech platforms are doing enough. Um, so I'm as critical of TikTok as I am of Meta of Twitter. Um, right down the line. And and they're not. Uh, you know, look, this is their ne- next growth frontier. And, you know, they, they should own that and, you know, and, and say it out loud because their actions in terms of, um, you know, hiding research that shows that there are mental health issues as a result of being on the platform, the features that they offer. I mean, look, you've got children. Mm-hmm. You go on YouTube, kids, or it's, if, whether it's autoplay or just those, the, the, the addictive quality of those platforms. They know what they're doing. Um, and of course th- they do. Of course they do. And we are behind in the United States in terms of what the EU has done, what the UK has done, and putting those protections in place. The United States is behind. And look, we know why, right? The tech lobby is a powerful one. Um, they'll be calling for privacy in, out there in their advertisements all the while. They're spending huge amounts of dollars to squash privacy legislation, which we passed 52 to 2 in our committee, bipartisan, right? We agree on having a privacy policy in our country that protects everyone, not just our children. Um, and so, and and I've been pretty vocal about transparency, uh, making sure that we give researchers access to platforms so that they can be our watchdogs uh, and ensure safety. There was a key moment in that testimony where you basically said to him, look, 
you you do this in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. Why can't you do it in America for our kids? And he kind of danced around it. But it seems like an easy fix for TikTok. Conversely, why can't we get the United States government to say, listen, we're going to implement the same requirements that England does. If England can do it, we can do it. What, what's the hang up on, on government taking action? Because it doesn't seem to me like he was all too enthusiastic. He, he wanted to push that discussion off when you pressed him on it that that is exactly right and and look the reason why we don't the reason um i asked him that question is because it cost TikTok and meta uh and all these other companies facebook instagram um for them to comply with one set of rules and then to do something differently in another geography right wouldn't it be so much more cost effective if they streamlined that well that tells you everything you need to know they're actually making money on more money on not doing that for our children uh look us we got the we got the privacy legislation right up to the 10 yard line uh, at the end of the last congress and if we had a little bit more time maybe the you know the senate um, you know, would have would have taken it up. We have to get it done. Um, it's embarrassing how long overdue it is. And and really, you know, we're st we're just playing catch up. Never mind getting out in front. I mean, think about all the technology that surrounds you today. What you wear on your, you know, your the wearables. You're in your car. Your thermostat. All of these devices are collecting information on you. And we need to make sure that there's a way for us to protect consumers so that that. Um, that data isn't being used just purely for profit and that um, and especially look our children I am um, I'm a, a tough critic not only in the privacy side but on age appropriate design um, these these platforms are designed to keep our children on longer and we know that that comes at a detriment to their mental health but look there's basic things that we can do that I think Republicans and Democrats agree on just in the way of transparency um, let you know, the, they know what harms they are, uh, they, they see on their platforms. Um, they're mitigating those harms through their content moderation, but they keep that in a black box and we don't get to see what it is. So that's a hard position to be in as a parent. We should have more transparency in terms of how content is being targeted to everyone, but most importantly, our kids. We're starting to hear renewed conversation about uh, outlawing TikTok in the United States. Former mm -hmm. President Trump actually talked about it in his term. I'm starting to hear a little bit of it from the Biden administration. Yeah. If, if they don't act, could you see yourself getting behind such an effort? You know, I have... I have huge concerns, um, and I don't think Mr. Chu, when he testified before our committee, did himself any favors uh, in terms of assuaging our concerns, right? Whenever you have an ownership structure the way TikTok has, um, there is nothing preventing the Chinese Communist government from just coming and taking data, right? Mm -hmm. 150 million users in the United States. That is a huge, uh, a huge amount of data. It puts us at a vulnerability, right? And so it's ultimately going to come up to the administration uh, in terms of of how they're going to negotiate, whether there is a full ban, whether there is a forced sale, whether there is a spin out, something. Um, but this, our national security comes first. And so I hope what our what that hearing did was give the administration more negotiating power with TikTok as they look at, you know, increased calls for bans to do something that can get us to a place that safeguards data uh, in a way that we feel confident. Conversely, there's a, there's a fine line with government involvement in these big tech companies in terms of censorship. Um, in the last couple of months, a lot of the Twitter files have been released uh, showing access government agencies, FBI, other, other administration officials, going back to the Trump administration and certainly the Biden administration, having backdoor portals to, be going, to go into Twitter and, and push them to censor certain speech. Do you share any of my concerns and other people's concerns on government telling folks what is and isn't misinformation, what can and can't be published? Look, I think misinformation and disinformation has never flourished at this rate. Um, and our tech platforms are in the center of that. Um, I think as long as our tech platforms remain black boxes um, and they don't have transparency practices, how could we possibly conf be confident in the decisions that they're making every nanosecond of the day? Uh, so look, I've, I've written legislation uh, on this, right? I mean, 
it used to be in different, you know, variations among platforms that researchers, independent researchers would have access to, they're called APIs, but basically data and the algorithms that the data powers so that they can be our watchdogs and they can say, okay, you know what, this is how this, this is how this content is being targeted to a certain population, or this is who's being muzzled, right? This is who's being like not targeted. Um, and I think we need that, right? I mean, in order for us to engage in responsible policymaking, we just need the data. And it can't come just from the tech companies because they have lied to us time and time again about what their motivation is and what their operations are. So I do think that getting behind transparency legislation so we understand um, the facts of if if people are getting censored on one way or the other, if platforms are spreading misinformation or disinformation, either willfully or just not picking it up because content moderation is hard, we need to understand that so we can fix it. Uh, and I think that Democrats and Republicans, it's interesting, they're coming at this diagnosis from different places, um, but that doesn't mean we're not going to agree on the prescriptions. Uh, and so I'm actually pretty hopeful. Uh, you know, I might disagree with, you know, my, one of my Republican colleagues on, you know, censorship versus spreading misinformation, who's responsible, but it doesn't prevent us from not co-sponsoring the, the same legislation around just basic transparency. So this is one area where I'm actually a little bit more hopeful than I might be in some others. Well, the challenge is with misinformation is determining what is misinformation, as we saw with the, the lab leak uh, theory of COVID's origins. What was dubbed misinformation yeah. for two years suddenly is the going theory. There have been other things out there about that. This is where I question is gov like can government like really the election. be <laughs> elections? Um, who's tampering, et cetera? The Biden laptop. You've heard all the all the talking points on both sides. This is where I question whether government can should have any role mm -hmm. in determining this. Uh, not that you know, that I, I agree with you wholeheartedly on the transparency component. We need yeah. to know what these I, what these companies are doing. But letting government get in there, that, that also starts to bring up constitutional issues that I think are going to be decided in the coming years. You know, it's interesting you bring it up. I've spent a lot of time on this, um, you know, because I'm not just a, a representative. I didn't just work in a tech company, but I'm also a mom, right? So I see this play out in real time just with my own children. Uh, and I think that there is a way um, to do this. Uh, of course, protecting free speech, but also having a level of transparency where you do not let these tech companies off the hook. I mean, I wrote legislation around beefing up the FTC. We don't even have technologists right now. I mean, you think about how small the FTC is vis-a-vis -vis, like the players that they're regulating, right? I mean, you know, a $20 million fine is like the cost of doing business for Facebook, right? So we really do need an agency that is equipped uh, with the right people people and the right expertise. And then we need the tech companies to like lift up the, the curtain uh, a bit, right? They're mitigating uh, or they're trying to mitigate harms that they see playing out on their platforms. They're seeing things that they're making decisions every single day about content. And that should be, that should go through a, a transparency uh, process, right? We should understand what those risks are. We should understand their mitigation. We should understand, you know, when they they do do things uh, in terms of shutting down a profile, what the what the recourse is for a consumer. Uh, and that needs to hopefully translate into across the board industry best practices that a government or a regulatory agency would have the power to, um, you know, to to regulate. And I know you have to go in a couple of minutes. You have a couple more functions. But I do want to before you go, I want to just kind of get your thoughts on uh college sports you've been oh. talking a lot about that and that that ncaa uh women's basketball game so was was this was this a bigger deal as it became on social media or is you as a former athlete okay with that you know i am um, <laughs> uh, let me back up and just say i had a blast watching the women's tournament uh you know, for the for the first time, my daughter, who's 13 next week uh, and a and a you know budding basketball player, she watched all of it. Right. Uh, which is something I couldn't do, uh, you know, when I was her age. And so I often say that the growth in college sports is going to come from women, uh, which is 
incredible because it's not only going to nurture uh, a new generation of women athletes uh, like my daughter Grace and Caroline, um, but it's also going to give, you know, women the prominence that they deserve. And so, you know, I'm pretty vocal on NIL issues, a uh, name, image, and likeness for, for college athletes. And um, I'm pretty adamant about using this moment to elevate Title IX uh, and the work that we still have to do there. There's lots of loopholes in mm -hmm. Title IX compliance, and I want to make sure that we're elevating women's sports as we go through some of these thornier issues on what the NCAA has to deal with um, uh, from an NIL perspective. But this tournament was great fun, and I watched <laughs> every bit of it on the women's side and on the men's side. All right. I <laughs> uh, appreciate you joining us. Uh, we'll talk a lot more i'm sure about the college sports stuff because that's starting to yeah. uh, to get out there with testimony and the whole the the role of transgender and whether uh, you, they should be competing in women's sports or whether do you form a kind of a title i don't know if you call it title 10 or or whatever <laughs> where, where you kind of offer the protections that you've talked about in the past while also protecting uh, the the female athletes as well so we'll that's a long discussion we'll yeah. save that for uh are you coming Maybe back we can, again we can invite charlie baker to that we're in Let's, <laughs> can you get him in here i've been trying like heck to get him in here um thank you congresswoman trahan thank for joining you, us and appreciate all the work you're doing out there appreciate in the you. uh in the district thanks so much all right and congratulations to you expanding into drake it there's more logos on the wall <laughs> yes. you're we're hey. growing we're yeah. growing quickly so thank you very much and thank all of you for joining us here uh we filmed this uh recorded it on wednesday april 5th uh whether you're watching it in just a couple of minutes after i upload it uh tomorrow or a week from now Check out Inside Lowell. As we like to say, it's news, it's information, and it's sometimes entertainment on your schedule, not ours. Till next time, everybody stay safe.